Julian, and thank you, uh, Kay and Joy, for reading the, the reading so well. So we've heard a little bit already uh, from Revelation 4 and 5, and that's the bit I've, I've got the joy of speaking on. What a beautiful passage it is. Before I get there, has anyone been in their working career in a, in a management role, a line management role? Who's, who's been in a line management role having to give feedback of some sort? Who's heard of the feedback sandwich? Who's heard of the feedback sandwich? The feedback sandwich, um, I can, it, it's, it's, this is the feedback sandwich. You say something good. Hey, I, I, I love the way you're looking today. Then you drop in the, the not very nice bit. Yeah, but I really am not happy of your work ethic. And then you finish off with the, but your shoes, they're wonderful. And uh, that is the feedback sandwich. Why am I telling you about the feedback sandwich? Because I see this in Revelation. As we, as we step into this next phase of Revelation, we start Revelation 4 and 5, and it is beautiful. It is the throne room. It is glorious. And then we seem to walk into the more difficult bits. And I'm so grateful I'm not having to preach any of those. And then at the end, we come back to the everlasting kingdom in Revela at yeah, the end of Revelation, and we see again this glory. And we do see glory through as we go through. But there's a sense of it starts and ends in this next section with worship. And that's a phrase I want us just to keep hearing. It starts and ends in worship. Because that's what I see here, and I've got the privilege of speaking at the starting bit. If you like, that's the good bit. And then some others will pick up on the more difficult bits as we go through. So Revelation, I'm just going to go through, I'm not going to read the whole thing, um, but we've heard some of it already. But the start of Re Revelation 4, then, I, then as I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven. And the same voice I had heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, come up here and I will show you what you must, or show you what must happen after this. You see how we're stepping now into the next phase of this, this revelation. We've, we've had the, uh, the opening words that Andrea brought as, as um, we saw the risen and glorified Christ. We've then had this section that has spoken to the church of the day, the seven churches, which still resonates with us. And now we move into this, the things that must happen after this. Now, this doesn't mean the next day. So it's not the next day this will happen. This is now and onwards. These things will happen from now on. It, there's a sense of we don't know when they'll happen. Are they happening now? Well, yes, they are, but are they, are they fulfilled now? No, they're not. And it's now on. There's a, a sense of going now on. But you notice here, there's an open door. Open doors always symbolise that sense of revelation. As John is looking up, he's seeing God saying, let me open the door, let me show you what is to come. And I want to focus on three focuses focus. As I look at this, John focuses on three things, and I want to focus on the three things he's focusing on, if that makes sense. Um, so we're going to focus in on three things as we look. And the first thing that John focuses on is this. And I was instantly in the spirit, and I saw a throne in heaven, and someone sitting on it. The first thing that John sees, he focuses it on, is the throne. The throne of God. And so we're going to focus in, on the, to start with, on the throne of God. And what do we see here? Now we've kind of lost the majesty, the awe of thrones, haven't we? But we, if you saw the coronation, um, was that last year? It was, wasn't it? Um, if you saw the coronation, you'd have seen some of that, that majesty, that pomp and ceremony on show. And there is something about a throne. It's a place of power and rule. It's a place of sovereignty. It's a place of justice and judgment. It's interesting that in terms of our legal system, you have the, the, the QCs and now the KCs, 
Yeah, that, that it's from the queen or the king comes the judgments. And it's a place of majesty and honour. But let's have a look what John sees. And interestingly, John sees seven things in, on, or around the throne. And so we'll just take a moment just to focus in on the throne and see what John sees. So number one, sitting, the one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones. Do you notice here, John sees God, but doesn't describe him. Because how can he describe the indescribable? He describes, or he just talks about light and colour and brilliance. He doesn't talk about features or, or anything of that nature. But there is a sense here that he is looking and he is seeing God, sit, the one sitting on the throne. And then around or circled, there was a glow of emerald, circled the throne like a rainbow. And this reminds us of covenant. This reminds us of God's grace, God's mercy, this circling around the throne. And then we see surrounding the throne, 24 thrones, the thr and then 24 elders sat on them. Who are these elders? This is one of these ones again, we don't know. Some would say it possibly goes back to the divisions in... Um, I think it's in 1 Chronicles 24 where, where the, tribe, uh, the, the descendants of Aaron are split into 24 groups so that they can minister. There's a rota, so there's constant worship. It might be that. I quite like this one. and uh, Some would argue this, this doesn't make sense, but I like it, so let me share this. That maybe there's an imagery here that there's the 12 of the 12 tribes and then the 12 of the 12 apostles. And this imagery of the completeness of the people of God before Jesus came and after he came. And it's this coming together of the whole people of God. But in, in whatever way we think, it's this sense of completeness, this constant worship. But also, maybe it's this completeness of the church or the people of God worshipping God. Maybe that's what it means. And then we have from the throne comes flashes of lightning and rumbles of thunder. For people of the day, that, anything that was lightning and thunder were, was often linked to God, to gods. And, the, it, you know, and we still talk about that, don't we? And, but, but for them, the sense of the, th the, the sound and the light would have signified the, the awesomeness and the sovereignty of God. And then in front or before the throne, we, we uh, were seven torches with burning flame. Whenever we hear the seven torches, I don't think anyone's mentioned this, that's the Holy Spirit. So the seven torches are the, is the Holy Spirit. Why seven? Because it's a, it's a number of completeness, a number of holiness, but also it possibly signifies all of the different ministries and roles that the Holy Spirit fulfills. And so there's the Holy Spirit there in front of the throne. And then before, in front of the throne, there's a, a, a shiny sea of glass. Again, people don't really know what that signifies. Sometimes sea in the Bible signifies multitudes. But, a, 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 yeah, the vastest of people. But often it's, it's the, the waves and the, 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 the sort of storms signify the, the storminess of people. But here, this is glassy sea. Maybe it's about the, the fact in heaven there is wholeness. There is peace and stillness. Some would also say maybe it links back to the Solomon's temple that was built and there was the sea of bronze in which the priests would wash their hands. And maybe it signifies that. Or maybe it's just a symbol of God's glory. We don't really know. And then in the centre... There are these four living beings, each covered in eyes, the first like a lion, the second like an ox, then a one with uh, like a human face and one like an eagle. Maybe, I mean this links back to Ezekiel and, and the imagery that Ezekiel saw. Maybe this signifies majesty, strength, wisdom and loftiness. Or maybe it's just as simple as these four creatures signify the whole of creation. 
the different created beings, the different kinds of creation that God has. And so maybe what we have here is just from a simple point of view, we have the whole of God's people and the whole of creation in constant worship. Maybe it's just that, that, that what we see here is this all of God's people and all of God's creation worshipping him. But that leads us to our second focus, because our second focus is worship. Because that's what's happening in this throne room. Day after day and night after night, they keep on saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the one who always was, who is and who is still to come. And then the 24 elders fell down and worshipped the one sitting on the throne and say, you are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things. And they exist because you created what pleases you. This is a beautiful picture of this constant nature of worship. And at this stage, why are they worshipping God? Because he is worthy. Full stop. They're not, they're not, they're not worshipping him for anything he's done, just that God is worthy. Full stop. Because he is worthy of our praise. Whether he has done anything before or since, doesn't matter. He is still the one who is worthy. Why? Because he is God. And he, he deserves our praise. It's not, let me say this without being flippant. This can, it can sound a little bit, when you read this, a little bit like a, a, a diva who needs someone to, around them all the time to say, hey, you're great, hey, you're brilliant, you're brilliant, you're brilliant. It's not that. It's not that God needs this affirmation. It's that, that God is worthy. He is glory. He doesn't need it. He doesn't need our affirmation. He doesn't need our praise. But he is worthy. He is praise. He is, he is deserving of our praise. Does that make sense? There's, there's, a, 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 there's no reason to worship him apart from the fact that he is the one who should be worshipped. And it's constant. It starts and ends with worship. It's a constant thing. It's there all the time. It's, it's that sense of they are just worshipping him. And they're worshipping his perfect holiness. They're also worshipping that he is the creator, the one who has created everything, who sustains everything. Let me just pause for a minute. And sorry, I, I, I don't want this to sound um, wrong in any sense. But let me just drop this out as a challenge. Have we lost this? Have we lost this sense of the worthiness of God in our worship? Has worship turned into entertain me? Warm me up. Help me worship God. Rather than the responsibility or the heart for us to say, he is worthy, so I will praise him. Has worship made... You know, you, you hear the, I think it's Chris Bowater sort of once said, you know, someone came up to him and said, oh, I, I really didn't like that worship song that you did today. And Chris is well, that's okay, because it wasn't for you, it was for God. It's not there to entertain you, it's not there to tickle your, your, your entertainment, you know, or, or warm you up. We are singing words because he is worthy. And I know, having led worship over the years, sometimes, and again, this is not a criticism because I fall into this, sometimes we can find on a, on a Sunday, you know, it used to talk about the first song was just like a throwaway song because it would warm people up and get people into, into the right mood. That's sad, isn't it? Because if it starts and ends with worship, then we should be starting our day with worship. And when we walk into here, it should be about us connecting with each other to worship, not having to be warmed up. Now, I'm aware. I'm aware that we go through uh, the realities of a Sunday morning. And, I mean, let's take this morning. It's been raining. Some of you have walked in the rain and that's been horrible. And, that's, and then maybe something's just happened before you got in the car and it's been grumpy and everyone's got a bit grumpy. And I'm aware of that. 
And that's okay. That's okay to, 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 that's life. But we should do what we can to start our day in worship and end our day and fill our whole day with worship. The Bible talks about worship and praise being a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice of praise. Psalm 116 says, I will offer to you a sacrifice of thanksgiving. That's something that will cost us. That's worship when we don't feel like it. That's worship when we want, and you know what, I really don't want to. But I am choosing to sacrifice or to lay down myself to worship him. I am choosing to be the one who is lifting up his name and worshipping him. It starts and ends with worship. Let's move into chapter 5 because we see something shifts in chapter 5 as we've heard. Chapter 5 is where we suddenly, the, the focus shifts and we, we have this situation where there's one on the, the, the one on the throne, God, is holding a scroll. And I'll let some others talk about the scroll. I'm not going to go into it this week. I'm hoping someone else will pick it up because there's seven seals that need to be opened. So there's seven, there are lots of opportunities to, to pick it uh, what is on the scroll, it's, it's written on both sides, it's held there. It's probably the what's to come, it's that sense of God holding the future, the destiny. And there's this cry from, from John saying, who, you know, or, or the angel cries, who is worthy to open this scroll? And John looks and he, he's distraught. He's distraught. Who is worthy to break the seals on the scroll and open it? He, he is distraught. Because he, he says, well, no one is. None of us are worthy. None of us are good enough to, to be able to be in that position. There, there was no one. And then one of the 24 elders turns to him and says, look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne, has won the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. And then John says, then I, as he looked, this is, this is often the case in Revelation, that John will hear one thing, but he'll see something else. He'll hear something, but he'll see something else. That's okay. That's, so he hears the lion of the tribe of Judah, but he sees the lamb. It looked as if it had been slaughtered. The lion and the lamb. And so our shift, our focus now shifts to focus on Jesus. It doesn't mention Jesus here, but... We know it's Jesus, don't we? We know it's Jesus as he's talking about the lion and the lamb. We, and every one of his readers will have known that he was talking about Jesus in this. You see, he focuses in on the lion. The one, the lion, the, the victory. But he also sees the lamb, the sacrifice. And this is this beautiful thing that we hear in the gospel. And again, this, this summarizes the gospel up so, so well. That Jesus is the one, the overcomer, the one who overcame the power of sin and death. But he did it through sacrifice. It's victory through sacrifice. Not victory through strength or victory through um, uh, scheming. It is victory through sacrifice. And this imagery of the lamb is th this imagery of the Passover lamb. This is redemption. This is the, the um, for, for the people reading at the time, they would have thought about the Passover and the story of Israel in, in Egypt where there was this threat or God said, I will, you know, I will kill all the firstborn. But then the, the Israelites were able to sacrifice a lamb and sprinkle the blood on their doorposts. And then the, the angel would then pass over those houses. And there's a sense here that as we receive God's forgiveness, uh, sprinkle ourselves in the blood of the Lamb, we are passed over. That he, he passes over in terms of his judgment because we have taken on the righteousness of Christ. The other thing to notice here, and it gets a little bit lost in the, the language depending on what translation you have, is where is the lamb? 
And actually, it's understood that from the language they're talking about, the lamb is in the centre of the throne. Is on the throne. So what does that tell you about the lamb? To be on the throne. It just tells you it's God. This is our triune God, that Jesus is God. Our, our God three in one, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. He was there on the centre of the throne. And the people's responses was to worship the one on the throne and the Lamb. And so he is worthy of our worship. This is our God, Jesus, the one, the, the, the man God, the one God who came down to live in human form so that we may know life in all its fullness. And then we step into if you like the gospel story, and let me just dwell on this for a little bit. In one of the songs, I think they, they, they sing in this new song, they sing the gospel. And if you've, if you've never quite understood what the gospel is, have a look at this song. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. I think this sums up the gospel. And let me just dwell in there, because it starts to talk about that you are worthy. And it's a sense of, we are not, in our own strength, we cannot satisfy God. We are not worthy to come to, to God in our own strength. We cannot pay the price that we that has been demanded because of our mistakes and our failings. But there is one who is worthy. The perfect spotless lamb. The son of God who, who lived as a man but did not sin. And did not uh, break those laws of God. But then he chose to go to the cross. To pay the price for us. That he was slain. It's the lamb who was slain, a sacrifice. There was a cost, a huge cross as he hung on the cross. And he carried on the cross the weight and, the, and the, the punishment of the sins of the world. Not just there, but beyond, and uh, yeah, but into the past and into the future. And the sins of the world were laid upon him. And as he hung there on the cross, he was able to say, it is finished. In other words, it's paid for. I've paid the price. I have finished it. I have broken the curse that is on, uh, on humankind. And we can then step into this, this sense, this redeemed. We were ransomed. We were paid. He paid a price so that we could come out of where we were. And he paid that price through, the, through his blood, through his life. In other words, he brought our freedom. He said, you're worth it. You're worth it. And I will pay that price for you. And I'm saying that word you because I, I want you to hear you, not us. He didn't pay the price for us. He paid the price for you. So that you may know this sense of this openness to God. And then we see here, who is, who is this for? It's for everybody. Every tribe and tongue and people and nation. There is no one who is not able to receive the, the, the forgiveness of God through Jesus. There's no one that has done anything that is too wrong or too bad. There is no one, there is no nations, there are no peoples, there are, there are no groups. This is the gospel for everybody. However you're feeling today, this is a gospel for you. He paid the price for you so that you can be brought into his kingdom. That's the next part of the gospel. He didn't just pay a price and leave us. He said, I will pay the price. Now come into my kingdom. Come and be part of my family. Come and be a, you know, a, a son or a daughter of the living king. Come and be welcomed in and given a place of honour. Come and be part of all that I have. I want you to be there. I delight in you being there. And it, it says there, he gives us a purpose. 
to be kings and priests to our God. We now have a role, we have a purpose, we have a reason to live. Not just to worship him, but to serve him, to be his, to be his, his, his worshippers, his servers, and to help him rule in that sense of bringing his kingdom to this earth. Can you see the completeness of the gospel? That it's, he's paid a price, he's, he's made the way for us, but he's then brought us into something and he said, this is for you. You see, not only can we worship God as creator, as we read in, in Revelation 5, we can worship him as saviour too. We can worship him as the one who has redeemed us and saved us. And let me just pause, because I don't know where you are in terms of that, but if you have never known that redemption, that, that sense of being... sense of knowing that you are forgiven, knowing that you have been made right with your God and your Creator, knowing that you have been welcomed in, it's a simpler case of believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth, believing that... That, that he is the one who is worthy of praise. And confessing with our mouths and saying, God, I am sorry for the mistakes I've made, but I confess that you are the saviour. So forgive me for all the things I've done wrong. And thank you that you now welcome me into your kingdom. And if you've never known that certainty that assuredness of salvation and, and being saved, I want to pray with you at the end of the service. Because that is there for every single person. It's not about, I hope I'm going to be okay. There's a certainty as we know who God is and what he's done for us and we can receive his full forgiveness. We can receive the righteousness of Christ to be able to then go and stand with him. And that's why people in this room can praise and worship with such loud voice because there is a certainty in our salvation. And if you don't know that certainty, I want to pray for you because I, because I believe every single person who comes and says, God, I want that. I, I want your forgiveness. There is a certainty that will come. I would love to pray for you at the end. But let me just draw this to a conclusion because I just want to finish with this and it starts and ends with worship. It starts and ends with worship. I hope you've just seen a bit of the beauty of, and I hope I've given it a little bit of, uh, able to give it a little bit of um, the credit in terms of the beauty in Re Revelation 4 and 5. But it starts and ends in worship. And our days, Revelation, it seems to start and end in worship, but our days, our lives, who we are, should start and end in worship. I don't know what you're like with worship. I don't know how good you are in terms of worship. And I don't just mean singing songs. We see here about posture. We see, we see them in terms of kneeling and posture, as well as song is an important thing. And maybe you don't like singing. Well, I, I, part of me would say, just get, kind of get over that and sing, because <laughs> it's good for you. It's what God's created, a mechanism of praise and worship. It does you good. How many of us sing when we're happy or whistle when we're happy? There's something about singing that lifts our spirits. It is a good thing to do. And we need to focus in on the throne. That as we worship, that focus on the throne, that there is a God seated on the throne in charge. We need to focus in on worship, to worship him because he, of who he is. And we need to focus in on Jesus, the saviour, the one who has saved us and set us free. I'd, I'd ask the band to do a song, and, and it's a slightly odd one in the sense of, what, yeah, where does this fit? But I think it does. Because in a sense, this picture in Revelation is a picture we can read, but we can't necessarily see. And there are times in worship where we have to, to understand, but we may not see. And this song that they're going to see, it comes from another Old Testament story. Uh, and it's just a story where um, Elisha and his, his servant looked like they were completely surrounded by the enemies. They looked like they were completely distraught. 
And then when the servant of the man of God got up early the next morning and went outside, there were troops and horses and chariots everywhere. Oh, sir, what will we do now? The young man cried to Elijah. And I think there's a few of you that are feeling like that. You're feeling like, you know what, I am surrounded by troops and horses and chariots and issues and problems and, and all sorts of stuff. But Elisha said, do not be afraid, for there are more on our side than on theirs. Then Elijah prayed, O Lord, open his eyes and let him see. And the Lord opened the young man's eyes. And when he looked up, he saw the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. And I think something happens when we worship. When we worship, we connect into the heavenlies. We understand what God is doing. It, 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 it allows our spiritual eyes to see the, the spiritual realities and not just the earthly realities. And if we're going to have worship from start to finish, we need to see what God is doing and not just what physically seems to happen. So I know it seems a little bit of an odd one to, to do off the back of a beautiful revelation, but I just want us to know that we can have our lives from start to finish in worship. We can just allow all that we are to be fixated on him in the midst of the battle, in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the troubles. So I'm going to invite the band forward. I'm going to ask you to stand because I'm going to get you to do something before we start singing. So let's stand, folks. Do cry. Because I just want us to do a little bit of practice and rehearsal because... Sometimes it can feel odd to worship when we're on our own, but it, it feels a lot easier when there's music. But before the music starts, I just want us to start to lift our voices. And I want you to start to speak out, sing out, just to lift up your voice in worship to him. Because that's what we can do, and that's our right, and that's our privilege to worship him. So can we all just start to do that and lift our voices in worship, because he is worthy. Yeah. You, you are worthy, God. You are worthy. You are the one who is worthy. We are so grateful and we praise you we lift you up we acknowledge that you are the king and the lord and the and the, the mighty one we lift you up oh jesus oh she died up you are worthy god you are worthy god we thank you jesus we thank you jesus we praise you we praise you, we praise you. We praise you. Jesus, and Jesus, I pray that each one of us will find a new openness, a fresh passion in worship as we acknowledge who you are and understand who you are. And I pray for those who are walking through tough times that there will be victory in, uh, because of what is sung and what is declared. And I pray that you will, you will put a fight back into us to uh, allow us to see what you are doing in the heavenlies. Yes. How you are moving and manoeuvring your, your mighty angels on our behalf. Yes. So we choose to praise you, we choose to worship you, we choose to lift up your name, Jesus. Because you are worthy of our praise. Yes. Amen. Amen.